Welcome to Sky King Radio. I'm your host, Zimmer, and uh, thanks for joining us for the first episode of what I hope will be many of this little podcast slash radio show. Uh, My name is Zimmer. That's about all you need to know about me for now. I mean, no, that's not my real name, but it's... uh, Anyways... uh, this this will let me uh, start off by telling you exactly what you've gotten into, what you've stumbled upon. This show is basically a free-form talk show where I'm going to be exploring different ideas, mostly having to do with things like, let's say, the paranormal, uh, you know, esoteric, occult, uh, conspiracy theories, uh, basically anything that's going on in the world that's strange, weird, a little bit on the fringe, that's basically what we're going to be dealing with here. So if that doesn't sound like something that you want to listen to, maybe, uh, maybe now's the time to shut it off. But If those are the kind of things that interest you and those are the kind of things that you enjoy thinking about on your own time, then, hey, maybe we might have something. So, let me tell you a little bit about why why I started this show. Uh, Since I was pretty young, like I'd say since I was maybe say, 13 or so years old, I was, I got, I would say, obsessed with conspiracy theories and with researching, like, different paranormal subjects and uh, topics that were on the, like I said, on the fringe. And uh, I just always had a mind for mystery. I always wanted to I always wanted to know like the things that were being hidden from us or the things that only a few people knew about. And you know, just like any other young teenager, when I started getting into researching different topics like, you know, Bigfoot, aliens, uh you know, uh, political assassinations, uh, you know, the secret government, all those kind of things. When you're that age, you're not very discerning of information. I mean, your mind is basically just an open gutter that lets anything pour into it. So, you know, I, I went, I went pretty crazy with it. I mean, I was (laughs) like, you know, week to week, my vision of what the world was like changed, you know, week to week. But, uh, you know, throughout, I, I had a lot of different interests growing up, but there was always that underlying current of um, a sense of truth-seeking. Like, I wanted to, I always had the sense right from, like, the earliest memories I can remember I always had the sense that the the vision of the world that we were getting presented with in the mainstream media and the things, the picture of the world that was presented to us in uh, the public education system and uh, through most of the people that you meet day to day, I always felt like there was something missing or that there was something, there was a whole lot of things that we weren't being told, essentially. And that feeling never left me throughout my whole life. And one of the reasons why I decided to start this radio show is because I'm not an expert in anything. (laughs) I mean, I I really can't say I'm... 
I'm any kind of an authority on any subject. Uh, I'm just a completely normal, average person. I live in Alberta, Canada, and, you know, I've done a little bit of traveling, but essentially everything I'm going to be talking about comes from research that I've done and uh, my own experiences that I've had. I've had a pretty good amount of odd experiences in my life, so I'm hoping that, you know, during this show, I can not only... Uh, you know, throw around ideas and explore topics, but I, I can maybe uh, talk to you about some things that you've never heard before. You know, at least uh, stories from my own life of things that I haven't really shared with people. Because that's another aspect of why I'm doing this, is that I I want this show to be, I mean, don't take this the wrong way, but I'd like to vent a little bit. I'd like to... Uh, talk freely about some things that I always never really felt too comfortable with sharing with people in my day-to-day life, just because as anyone who's into uh, these kind of weird topics knows, there's not too many people who will really readily accept a lot of things that are really far outside of the usual paradigm of things that we're supposed to think are important. I mean, that's changing a little bit in our society, but still, there's, you know, there's only so much weirdness people are willing to accept before, you know, you start getting labels put on you. Uh, So anyways, uh... For this, sh- for this show, I mean, I'm going to be going through some things that are, like, I'm going to be going into some things that are in the news and uh, some just uh, big subjects in the paranormal, strange phenomena world. And, uh, you know, we'll spitball. We'll just see where the trains of thought take us. I'll tell you my uh, my visions of some things and, you know, my opinions on a lot of a few issues. Some of them I might have firsthand knowledge of. Some of them I might just be speculating. And uh, before we get started here, there's going to be a few different places that you can catch episodes on. There's going to be a few different places where you can get in touch with the show and you can send us your comments, your suggestions for uh, topics that you might want to hear covered. And so first off, the main place that I'd want you to look for episodes is our YouTube channel, which is, uh, you can find it under Sky King Radio on YouTube. Uh... Um, We might be having video uh, versions of the podcast radio show, but for now it'll probably be audio only. And then as we move along, you know, it might turn into something different. And uh, if you want to send messages to the show, if you want to communicate with us in any way, uh, we have a Twitter page too. Same thing, Sky King Radio on Twitter. And you can search for that. We also have a Facebook page. Same thing, Sky King Radio. Uh, And another site I would like any of our listeners to check out is a a fairly new forum called uh, Anonymous Truthers. Now, this is a... a, um, a forum that I've gotten involved in that's based in the same general location as me in Alberta, Canada. And they deal with all the types of things that uh, that we'll be dealing with on the show. You know, like all the, the kind of topics you want to discuss, you know, uh, secret government things, UFOs, uh, religion, survival, you know, prepping... Uh, anything, any kind of like 
any kind of odd subjects you want to discuss in an anonymous or semi-anonymous way, you really should check them out. You can find them at anonymoustruthers.com. And uh, if you go to that forum, you'll be able to see links to our show. And they also have a radio station based out of there that you can listen to called Bias Propaganda Radio. And uh, you'll be able to listen to uh, Sky King Radio episodes on that also. We're just getting the details worked out on that, and you should be hearing us on there pretty quick. So, I think that's about it for uh, for those that kind of business. So, I want to go into a little story that I came across. Well, we'll go through a few of them, just to... Uh, get into the meat of things. I uh, There's a site called beforeitsnews.com. Now, I got to be honest, it, it looks a little sketchy. I've always thought it's a little, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I would take anything you see on some of these alternative news sites with a grain of salt because usually their sources are, uh, you know, they're, they're a little questionable sometimes. You're never really sure exactly where uh, a lot of these stories come from and their leads and things like that. But I, I thought this was interesting because this is an article posted on there on uh, Friday, April 17th. So it was a little while ago because uh, we're already in May here. But remember Edward Snowden when all of the stories about him leaking all this information from being an uh, NSA insider came from? Well, the big thing that he got known for was uh, the big leak about what was going on with the NSA's kind of massive uh, spying operation that was going on with, you know, uh, basically monitoring as many people as they could and gathering information from the internet, phone calls, etc. And that that's where everyone first really heard his name and heard the story. Now, for people who are into conspiracy theories and are into these kind of subjects, none of this was a surprise, really. I mean, it was one of those uh, stories where uh, once we heard it, it was kind of like, it was uh, like a a well duh moment it was like everyone everyone knew this was happening but we never had we never had sources that were as quotable as uh as edward snowden you know everyone uh you know if we if you tried telling people about that about the idea that your uh your phone calls and your text messages and your emails and your Facebook communications were getting stored and analyzed, you know, most people kind of play it off as, oh, you know, whatever. And all of a sudden, this guy's face is on the news and, you know, mainstream news stations are covering the story about how he's, you know, whistleblowing about all these projects. And then suddenly now everyone's on board with it. But for a lot of people, I think it was a little thing of like, you know, too little, too late. Like we we knew about that a long time ago. It's way past the time that we would be surprised at things like that happening. Uh, but the the thing that's interesting about Edward Snowden is, you know, he's in hiding essentially now or he's uh, being protected by a, another government group. Uh, you know, I haven't really looked into the story. I think he's in Russia. I think that's where he is or Switzerland where, I don't know. I don't really, I don't remember, but he's being basically protected by uh, another country. You know, I mean, the U S at first they were saying that they wanted to prosecute him if, if they ever got a hold of him and you don't, you don't really hear too much. But he, this Edward Snowden, kept coming out with new uh, information. You know, like after the big NSA security leak, 
he came out maybe two or three other times with different information. And uh, this story that is at uh, beforeitsnews.com kind of caught my attention because I wasn't expecting him to come out with anything that was this kind of out there. I'll just tell you the headline here. Edward Snowden. UFOs come from ultra-terrestrial civilization in Earth's mantle. (laughs) So, essentially what the source is claiming is that uh, Edward Snowden's latest uh, information leak has to do with uh, UFOs that have their origin in underground civilizations that are kind of uh, existing alongside Earth. So, I thought this was really interesting because, you know, like he's essentially saying that there's this race of super advanced uh, humanoids, essentially, that are living in underground areas on the Earth. Now, I think... uh, If people are into these subjects, you'll know that there is tons and tons of information out there about people who have researched uh, different um, mysterious underground structures that are supposed to be all over the planet. Now, this is a subject that I've been really interested in about for a long time. Especially because it relates to one of the more infamous uh, conspiracy theories or fringe theories that is out there on the web. And that is the theory about the hollow earth. Now, uh, I would would say if we're going to tackle this topic, because this is essentially what this Edward Snowden leak is about. Like, it's essentially the idea that there's some form of large-scale habitats under the Earth's crust. And the way I think about it is that the hollow Earth theory, there's two main facets to this theory. There's two big ways of approaching it. The kind of kookier or the stranger side of it is the idea that that really the Earth is hollow, like that there's a enormous space inside the planet, and that the crust that we live on on the outside is just kind of this thin veneer, and that there's an entire other planet kind of coating the inside of this. Uh, giant hollow sphere with a second sun in the middle, etc. Now, that that theory, uh, I'll admit, I, I kind of, I was considering it when I was 16 years old. Now that I'm not, I'm not totally deriding it or anyone that uh, really believes in it, but it's tough to swallow, that's all I'll say. And uh but there's a second there's a second um there's a second way to interpret that theory that I think is actually actually could be something to seriously consider is that the idea of a hollow earth and you know a, a different advanced civilization inhabiting the hollow earth you can actually think of that more as the fact, I mean the fact, the actual real concrete fact that there are enormous underground uh, systems of caves and hollowed out areas in the, in the ground. And this is not really so much of a fantasy. It's not really so much of a a wild idea. It's more the extent of it that's in question. Because we know already about how 
how much money has been spent by different governments. Take, for example, the U.S. government and how much money they've spent in developing underground bases. I mean, if you if you don't really know anything about this topic, uh, you can simply Google underground military bases and you'll find uh, lists and lists of documented kind of acknowledged but not really discussed bases that are, you know, in different places of the United States. And so the reason why I'm saying this is because I always feel like the hollow earth theory, I think that the idea that that there is simply enormous underground spaces where either groups of humans, you know, uh, operate in different capacities in a clandestine way underground, or there's truly kind of non-human entities that use these kind of uh, spaces for different things. That, I think, is really the true hollow earth theory. That's really what what we really should be focusing on because, you know, like I said, I don't want to, I'm not going to make fun of anyone who believes in the, that kind of mystical hollow earth where, you know, there's openings at both of the poles that you can fly into and all that kind of stuff. I'm not, I'm not ruling that out. I'm just saying it's more realistic that what we could be dealing with is that there's almost a second planet within planet Earth, that these underground areas could be so extensive that there's essentially a whole other world that we're not privy to going on under our feet. (coughs) Now, uh, there was a story that I wanted to kind of, uh, I wanted to tell on this show I kind of thought of it specifically when I came across this article about this Edward Snowden leak. And it's kind of my only personal connection to this story. It's the only way I can actually say that I have uh, some original thoughts on it. Because, you know, there's been tons of people doing research on this topic since, since the beginning of the internet and, you know, the beginning of popular conspiracy theories. Because, see, this uh, Edward Snowden leak kind of deals with uh, the idea that a lot of UFOs that we see are actually coming from underground civilizations, that they don't really have much to do with uh, beings from outer space or other planets. And I don't find that too hard to believe because... I personally have an inkling that there might be uh, different living things kind of underground in different areas of the world. And, you know, we've heard a lot of stories. There's been a lot of uh, eyewitness accounts from different parts of the world where people have seen UFO craft or unidentified flying vehicles that do things like enter into places in mountains, like say go, like they look like they basically fly into the ground in different remote locations or say they go underwater. Like there's, there's eyewitness accounts of UFOs uh, diving under the water and disappearing or coming out of the water, coming out of, uh, the so- mountain sides and things like that. Now, I'll, I'll tell you a little story uh, that I heard uh, secondhand, I guess you could say. And it relates to uh, some knowledge that Native American groups in the Americas have about underground beings. Uh I'm going to narrow our focus down to an area of New Mexico in the United States. Now, I have uh, certain personal connections with a tribe down there. 
that are kind of known as uh, the Pueblo Indians or Native Americans down there. And that's about as specific as I'll be for now. But they inhabit an area in northern New Mexico. And they... I didn't know this for a while. I heard these stories kind of when I was in my late teens. But apparently the idea of uh, advanced beings living underground is not a new idea to them. It's something that's uh, known in closed circles and behind closed doors. It's kind of known as a fact. It's known as a kind of a just a reality of the world that we live in that there's these uh, creatures or entities that live alongside humans. Now, when I first heard these stories, I honestly didn't, I honestly didn't think much of them. I was, I more thought of them as just kind of interesting uh, campfire stories. But once I got a little older and I mulled these around in my head a bit, I started really feeling very lucky that I had heard these stories because they um, they approach this subject from a perspective that I don't think many people have heard before, especially because these stories and these encounters that these native people had with these entities as far as I know, has not really been documented by any, uh, say, anthropological groups or people that study these native tribes. It's very much something you have to hear. It has to be orally uh, transmitted to you. You're not going to find books that deal with these subjects or have these stories written down. So... um, I was a little conflicted about whether I was actually going to tell the story on the on the show, but like I said, this is also something for me to share things that are hard to find an audience for. I guess I could say it that, that way. And uh, a lot of the stuff that I think about, and a lot of the stuff that I know about. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of hard to keep to myself, but I also don't like talking about it too much because I feel like because of a lot of my experiences, I'm already kind of labeled as a crazy person, I would say. You know, I already, I already have, I'm already in that camp of weird, odd people with ideas that you really shouldn't take too seriously. So, anyways... Uh, here's basically the story as it was related to me. Now, an interesting thing about this is that this was not told to me as if it was a a legend or a myth. The way this was told to me was more as a, a recent historical account. As in, it was something that happened not too long ago and was kind of told to me matter-of-factly. And the story is essentially this. Um, I'm going to give a little clue out as to exactly uh, where these people live and uh, what tribe I'm talking about. So if you actually do research, you could probably kind of figure out, you know, some more details that I won't go into, but this particular native group has an area that's very sacred to them that uh, they use for different sacred ceremonies and different rituals that they do, different religious type things. And this area is called uh, Blue Lake. It's in northern New Mexico. And it's essentially a lake that's on top of a mountain that's nearby this tribe. And they go up to this lake annually, 
and they, uh, you know, they do different, uh, ceremonies up there, you know, you know, you know what that entails, dancing, singing, different, different activities like that. And so the person who told me this story kind of started out telling me about, about what it's like to be up there. That this this area is completely off limits most of the times of the year. It's not it's not a it's not a national park. It's not somewhere that you can go on a pleasure hike and go camping. It actually is restricted by the tribe that owns the land. They do not let people just wander up there. You either go with the groups that go up there for these ceremonies or, you know, you, uh, you basically it's, it's a, it's a very protected area, uh, for reasons that I think will be clear after I finish the story. <clears throat> so the, one of the th- interesting things they told me that I've heard in a few different places is that, you know, when they go up to this lake and they're camping there and, uh, During the night, they build, you know, a fire to sit around and they they sing songs. And they have a a real specific instruction to the people that are attending these ceremonies that during the night, they are never to leave the area of the campfire because by their own words, there are spirits or entities or essentially there's other living beings that are in that area and that you're not to leave the campfire area because if you say go wander out into the dark well essentially something can happen to you you can be taken or something like that and This and at first I was just like, oh well, you know, that's just uh, that's just one of those stories you tell young kids to, you know, make them have safe habits while you're out camping. I didn't really think anything of it, but then they started getting into the story of something that happened. I I really can't give a specific date for when this occurrence happened. If I was to guess, I would have to say it happened within like the last 50, 75 years because the person telling me this story uh, heard it from someone who saw it happen. So essentially one or two generations before me, I'm 24 years old. The person who was telling me this story was around 45, 50. So, you know, yeah, you can guess maybe around 75 years ago is the time frame for this happening, which would put it at around, let's say, 1900s or so, the early 1900s. So the story is that this group was up on the top of this mountain at this lake performing these ceremonies. Now, it's been about around 10 years since I heard this story, so I'm going to have to kind of give you the, the Cliff Notes version of it. Because I honestly can't remember the the details of how it went. I'm just going to have to tell you kind of the gist of of what it was about. Now, at, at some point of the night, uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure it was at night because they didn't really give me a time frame for how these events occurred. But I'm guessing it was at night. The group that was up there came into contact with uh, some kind of being. Now, they don't, they didn't talk about it as if it was a spirit or some kind of, 
they didn't even talk about it as if it was a supernatural thing. It was more of a matter-of-factly, like, this was something that was not human. It was something that was kind of well-known to them. It was uh, some kind of an entity that that they were familiar with. That's the best way I could put it. And this uh, this thing kind of came into contact with the group. And uh, there's not really any indication of what the group's reaction was to it. But, I mean, I'm just kind of spitballing. They were probably a little shocked. There was probably, there was a, some in the group that were a little more aware of what it was and were familiar with the idea of these these entities. Now, I'm not really sure exactly the, the precise uh, details about how these events transpired, but essentially this entity started communicating with the group. And the interesting thing about about how this this event took place was that they didn't really give me any details about where this thing came from. It was kind of just all of a sudden there, just approached the group from nowhere, essentially. And here's the part of the story that, like I said before, I didn't really give much thought to when I first heard it because... I kind of heard it more as, like I said, a campfire story, like a just kind of a interesting legend, something, just something, you know, cool to listen to. And it wasn't until later that I thought about what happened and the implications of if this really occurred. Because, like, as I said, this was related to me as if it was an actual event, a historical event that happened with these people. Now, so back to the story, this entity starts communicating with the group and tells them, essentially, that that it requires of them that a member of their group has to accompany this being back to the place that it comes from. That this entity essentially inhabits a world that is in some way separate from our own and that it needs one of our people to go with it. And this is kind of like, I think, um, this part's a little disturbing about the story. And later on, I was a little bit surprised that the person telling me it kind of uh, said it in almost a casual manner. I felt like the person telling me it didn't really realize what it sounded like what was going on in this story because this this non-human entity essentially picked one person out of the group that was supposed to accompany this being back to its uh its world and it chose a young boy out of the group and said this boy has to come with us come with me back to uh back to our home. And the group, the group of native people, I think they essentially felt like they couldn't, they didn't seem to have any idea of refusing this request. That was something that I found very odd, that there was no mention of there was no mention that they disagreed with this entity or they even felt like it was possible to disagree with this 
this non-human being. It was as if once this thing picked out this young boy to accompany it, it, it was like, oh, well, I guess that's happening. Like there was no, <laughs> there was no discussion about it. There was no resistance to the idea. It was just like, this is what's happening. We have to deal with it. And here's the part that's really interesting is that by this account, the lake that's at the top of this mountain drained. It, it like within a matter of minutes, this lake that's from pictures I've seen is pretty big. It, it drained as if, you know, you pull the stopper out of a tub and the lake kind of drained out, dried out very quickly and this boy was kind of sent over to this entity and this entity and the boy walked out to the middle of the lake and like I said like these people were like I didn't hear anything about these people being upset at this event happening I get the sense that it was almost a uh some kind of a sense of powerlessness. This entity was not talked about in a reverential way. Like this, they weren't talking about like a god coming down from the sky, taking someone with them, or a deity or anything like this. No, this was just some thing that approached them and kind of made this this demand and kind of that was that no question about it so this entity walks this walks with this boy out to the middle of the lake and this is what the description was of what happened that the boy and this entity descended below the lake almost as if they were kind of on an elevator platform they're standing there and the surface they're standing on lowers underground and they descend below the surface, the dry surface of this lake. And as the boy and this entity kind of disappear from view and drop underground, the space that they dropped into closes up and the water fills the lake back up and the, the waters return and everything's back to normal and and that's it like that's where that's that's the story and like I said when I first heard the story yeah I was a little freaked out it's a it's a freaky story but later on, I really thought about it. I really, I've thought about it a lot all these years. Like I said, around 10 years since I heard this story, I, I think about it all the time. And I thought, doesn't that, doesn't that sound like a human sacrifice? Doesn't that sound almost as if this group of native people had to pay some kind of tribute to this entity because what would have happened if they refused right like was there any sense in the group that they could have said no to this like no you're not going to take a young member of our tribe and take them to your unknown underground layer and we don't know if we're ever going to see them again like no there was no there's no sense in that story they never the person telling me this story kind of related it to me as if that's just the way things go every once in a while these entities were in contact with me to take one of ours and they disappear with them and we never see them again when i first heard the story i I just kind of accepted it. It was just a creepy story. But later on, when I really thought about it, I was like, damn, this is, this is, this is pretty fucked up. I mean, like, 
essentially, if you break it down to the bare minimum, this native group had to offer up one of their young children to these underground entities. And apparently this probably happens periodically because this doesn't really sound like it's something that's a one-time occurrence. This probably happened more than that time. <clears throat> and so that brings me back to, you know, what I was saying about this idea of uh, civilizations living alongside humans on Earth in underground areas. Um, one of the ideas with this is that is that the one of the reasons why a civilization might choose to live underground as opposed to on the surface of of the planet is that the the climate and the environment under, underground is a lot more steady and stable so there's a lot of um there's a lot of like kind of environmental issues and cataclysms that can occur on the surface of the planet earth and so the idea is that these civilizations live underground so that they have a a more stable environment to live in that they're immune from a lot of the disasters and different kind of uh, large-scale changes that happen on the surface of the planet so that they they choose to live underground because it's safer and, like I said, more stable and steady. So I honestly don't know what to really think about this whole subject because by everything that I've heard from different sources and, you know, the the different information that's come out about just how involved we are as humans in underground uh, underground activity, I nowadays I really think it's almost logical that there's some type of either human or non-human group that lives under underground. And <clears throat> I, I truly think that we really don't know a lot about our own planet. I think we're really under the illusion that we're a lot more aware of the activities and the mechanisms of how our world works. Planet Earth, I think, is a lot bigger of a mystery for us than we would like to admit. There's a lot more that goes on with the on the surface, underground, in the air, in orbit, that we just have no clue about. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, I can't, uh, let's, uh, let's shift gears because this is pretty, yeah, let's, uh, let's go on to something else. Now, at first, you know, we're, uh, Sky King Radio is going to be, you know, it's just me right now. I'm just kind of talking to you one-on-one. -on -one. I will eventually have uh, some guests in our little studio here or I might do uh, shows in different locations. Uh, I have one co-host, my uh, a good uh, brother of mine named Mason, who's been a f been I've been uh, friends with him since we were in um, starting elementary school. And so he's going to be in studio at some point. He'll co-host a show with me. So, you know, we'll have a little bit of a back and forth, a little bit of a different perspective on things. So that, that should be good. I wanted to cover another, another story that came up in the alternative news circuit, if you would call it that. And this is a story 
out of Africa. This was really interesting when I when I read about it. The reason why I think it's so interesting is because I am very interested in topics that are almost unbelievable. You know, I I like I like looking at things on the internet or I like hearing stories that are so far outside of our usual parameters of reality that it kind of you either have to immediately call bullshit or you have to consider something that's that's just way out there now this the story out of Africa this uh, this article appeared on a website called ufointernationalproject.com. And this looks like it's another one of those real kind of uh, shifty, independent, uh, fringe knowledge websites. And there really wasn't, I, I couldn't really find, maybe I didn't look hard enough, but I couldn't really find any any a um couldn't find any other real uh reputable sources for this story it's kind of one of those things that just kind of it's floating around the alternative underground network but maybe for obvious reasons no real major news sources are covering it and uh here's the headline Floating interdimensional city witnessed by hundreds of villagers in Africa. Just let that that title sink in for a second. Uh, I'll just give you some quick quotes from the article. Here it says, There appeared a wide, large mass of something that looked like a cloud from nowhere, and it was flying slowly over the village just at the height of an average tree. And here, here's a quote from one of the witnesses that says, The cloud was transparent and I saw beautiful tall buildings inside of it with tarred roads and cars. It was like a flying city. And from it I could hear the sound of machines making noise just as you would hear at Ashaka Cement Factory. And uh, here's another part of the article. It says, To be fair, if Seydou, it's the name of the person who gave this account, if they had only had, if they had have been the only witness of this brilliant yet strange experience, it pretty much would have been impossible to take his personal testimony as fact. But it was then discovered after his statement that the flying city was witnessed by almost all of the villagers in the local area at the same time. In fact, hundreds of them, the chief imam of the Seoul village mosque including. Children and adults all saw and corroborated the exact same story. Now let's, let's, uh, let's get out of the way the most obvious thought when you read this story. Like the first thing you would think of is bullshit. This is just someone wanting a really interesting story on their website. So they thought up this idea and that's it. The second thought you might have is, you know, was this some kind of mass delusion was this some kind of some kind of weird happenstance of mass hysteria or a story that one person shared and a whole bunch of people just kind of jumped on board because they wanted to say they saw something weird? Those are what I would think are the first the first ideas that you would throw around and I mean, you can think that, but I myself have seen enough strange things and have been aware of enough 
really weird occurrences that I could... I'm not going to completely discount this story right away. I'm going to... I want to I want to think about this. I want to kind of think about <laughs> could this have happened? Could this honestly have happened? Could hundreds of people in Africa have really seen some kind of floating interdimensional city drifting over their their town or their village? And the idea of this the story kind of raises an interesting question for me or an interesting thought is that when it comes to a lot of the really strange stories that people tell about things that they've seen, uh, personal eyewitness accounts of UFOs and uh, unexplained beings and all sorts of really, really strange and weird occurrences, there's a certain point where where people who don't believe in these things will just flat out kind of, um, how would I say it? People will just completely deny and kind of uh, reject the authority of the other person's senses. You know, like, if you if you come across a really odd um, UFO story or a story of some strange creature someone saw in the woods, there's a tendency to kind of just say, oh, you were seeing things. You know, you uh, you were hallucinating you were drunk or you were on drugs or, you know, you were something. There's this tendency to kind of find it hard to believe another person's eyes, especially if you don't know them, you don't really trust them, etc. And so the idea I would want to get across to you is that if you haven't really seen anything that strange, like something like a floating city, I would say that, um, yeah, it can be hard to even entertain the idea. But me personally, I've seen strange enough things that... Uh, I'm, I'm open to it. I'm open to the idea that this happened. And the reason why is because I've seen some things uh, where I literally question my own eyes. I've seen some occurrences that made me question how easy it is to hallucinate things. Uh, there's been things like I've seen um, UFOs where there was something in the sky that behaved so oddly and essentially appeared in broad daylight and was so unbelievable for me that I kind of thought, did I really see that? Uh, like, did can I trust my own eyes with this thing that I saw? Because if I trust my own eyes, then I really saw something out there. And the interesting thing too is that when it comes to seeing uh, anomalous things with another person, I've had some instances where me and another person both saw at the same time really odd occurrences. Like, uh, for instance, I was with another person. And we saw, while we were kind of driving on the highway, there were these two parallel lines of clouds uh, descending from like high up in the sky. The way I could describe it is, you know, when you uh, use those, those uh, paint painting programs in computers and like, say if you use the spray can feature where, you spray kind of a light pattern onto whatever you're trying to draw. 
there was something like that, like two balls of white that were drawing these two parallel lines that were not going across the sky, but were going straight down. Thick, thick lines leaving these really thick trails of clouds that basically appeared out of nowhere and were drawing these two parallel lines straight down out of the sky. And we watched them for a minute or two, and then it just the the sources of these white lines of clouds just kind of disappeared. And it's hard for me to describe, but it was strange enough that, like, I knew we were seeing something completely out of the ordinary. And I looked at the other person. I said, you saw that, right? You saw what was going on with these two weird lines coming down out of the sky. And they said, yeah, yeah, I saw it. And then it was like, oh, you know, well, you know, it could have been, you know, uh, like they, they kind of played it off as if I saw something, but uh, let's just forget about it. And that's one thing that I want to bring up with a story like this. When you When you're talking about really strange things, when you're talking about things that are completely outside of our – normal range of thinking you can't expect people to even hang on to them in their mind because you know someone like me who's uh, used to thinking about strange things and is used to uh, dealing with really odd topics you know, if I see something really strange in the sky or I have some kind of encounter with some kind of uh, odd creature, I think about it and I hang on to the idea and I really try to use my uh, rational brain to try to figure out what I was seeing and what was going on. But a lot of people who don't think about those kind of topics, who don't have room in their worldview for these kind of things. I've seen a lot of people that will just kind of try to let it go. Like they, they'll see something strange and they'll just kind of, they'll debunk themselves. They see a UFO zipping around in the air, flying back and forth and zigzagging in broad daylight. They'll just say, oh, uh, I saw a bug. I, you know, I don't know. I was, you know, uh, I had a few beers. Oh, you know, I don't know. It could have been anything. And then they let it go because the thing is, is with a lot of these topics, it's easier to, it's easier to forget about it and it's easier to, to fool yourself into thinking that it was something more normal than it really was. It's easier to forget about it and debunk yourself than it is to deal with the idea that you might have actually experienced something that's that changes the way you look at things. So... As I said, if we're dealing with some subject like the story of a hundred people seeing an interdimensional floating city going over their village, you can there's millions of ways that you can debunk that or you can choose not to believe that that is actually what happened. But to me, think about what's what if a hundred people actually saw that? I mean, let's not even let's not even talk about the idea if there really was a floating city. Let's just let's just deal with the idea of did what if these people actually saw that? What if a hundred people really did see the same thing that is so out there? Because the thing you have to think about is that a hundred people seeing an event like that doesn't necessarily mean that there was a physical floating city going over this village in Africa. It could mean that there was something like a interdimensional rift 
that temporarily opened up and allowed this big group of people to see something that was completely uh, alien in the truest sense of the word, world, word. They might have seen something that was from another dimension. They, these people might have temporarily got a glimpse into a completely different reality. And can you imagine if you were one of those people and you actually saw that? How would that make you feel? Because I'm bringing this part up in the conversation because uh, I'd like you to kind of, you the listener, to kind of understand uh, the way I feel. Because I'm someone who, I've had a lot of really strange experiences in my life. A lot. And because of those experiences, I've, I've often, a lot of times, I've felt, I've had feelings of loneliness and isolation because there's been a lot of things that I saw that I honestly would like to say I hallucinated, but I didn't. And so, let's assume, let's assume that these people in Africa actually saw something like this. How would it make you feel if you saw a floating city? You know you saw it. There's other people that will back up your claims, but this story just gets lost. You'll never hear about this story. I I can guarantee you, you will not hear about this story anymore. There was this one article on one tiny little website, but that's probably it. You will not hear it ever again. And how would you feel if you saw something that was so shattering to your view of reality and it's dismissed, it's it's forgotten, it's basically played off as if it's, you hallucinated, you didn't see anything. How, like, how would you feel about that? And that's what, that's what, honestly, that's what I've had to deal with couple of times in my life. I've had to deal with seeing things and experiencing things where they it changed the way that I view the world, the way I relate to it. But when I, I've, you know, maybe tried sharing those things with other people, it's either hallucinations, it's, oh, you're just, you just want to make up a story to sound interesting, you know. Um, or they'll hear it and just kind of like, oh, yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, that's nice. And that's it. But, you know, I really do think that we are, we're in a time of transition as, uh, as far as the whole human race is concerned, I think we're in a time where our view of the world and the way that we relate to it is shifting. And that there are certain parts of our reality, like like we were talking about earlier, the very idea that we're sharing the planet with entities that are just as advanced, if not more advanced than us, that kind of try to stay hidden, or the idea that we are being visited by, you know, uh, non-human entities. These kind of topics in particular, I think we're in a time of transition where we will eventually like I'm 25 years old now, maybe in my lifetime we might see a time where these topics will truly come to light. Like, I mean, like, come out in the open, like evening news, President Obama, Prime Minister Harper give an address to the nation talking about the the alien issue and like how it affects you i re- i really think we're we're getting close to that 
Now, I don't really know how long this show is always going to be. I mean, we're a little over an hour now. Uh, we're probably never going to go over, like, say, two hours. But uh, let's deal with one more issue that I wanted to talk about. Then maybe we'll start wrapping it up. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the topic of aliens is has been probably done to death in most circles in terms of like alternative media and conspiracy theories and things like that. I mean, if you're even remotely interested in these topics, you've it's old hat by now. You know, like people have been talking about these kind of things since you know, the whole Roswell thing earlier than that. Uh but the part that's interesting for me when we talk about the topic of aliens, of non-human uh, things, is I'm always interested in people's personal stories because we can speculate on these kind of things uh, till the cows come home. But I'm always interested in people's personal experiences with people's encounters with what we would think of as aliens. Because I've had some myself, but I feel like the topic of extraterrestrials and all that kind of stuff is almost starting to be treated as an urban legend in our culture when there's a lot of people I'm only talking about North America I really honestly don't know what it's like around the world but there's a good number of people that this is something that has been a central part of their lives as in it's something that's really shaped the way they feel about things and uh, it's been like a, a very important aspect of who they are has been shaped by these experiences. And I'm talking about things like abduction stories and experiences. I'm talking about uh, times where people claim to have actually physically encountered, you know, aliens and... Uh, you know, even going to UFO sightings that are hard to dismiss or hard to debunk. And I can speak to this personally again because when I was young, I had a UFO experience. And I've had tons of them. I've had tons and tons of experiences with UFOs over my life. And I'm not that old. I'm only 25, I'm still pretty young, but I've had a lot of experiences, but there is one particular experience that I've had that overshadows most of the other things, because there's one that I've had that was so clear, so in your face that I can't deny it in any way, I can't I can't play it off as anything because, you know, if you hear a story about someone, oh, you know, I saw a UFO, I saw this little light in the sky, it was bouncing around or this little dot was moving in a weird way and it zipped off or something like that, like, it's you can let that go. But there's some uh, cases of UFO sightings that you can't let go because you saw something that was way more than a light. You saw something that was way more than than a uh, some erratically moving light in the sky. There's a lot of really well-known and well-documented cases of people uh, seeing physical craft, like they actually saw the shape of something or, you know, they encountered physical beings that were supposedly piloting these crafts. We'll talk about those some other time, but uh, I I haven't heard 
I don't know very many people personally that have had experiences like those. I've had a few. Maybe I'll talk about them uh, some other time. But for now, I'll tell you like one little story I have. I was in junior high or, you know, like grade eight, I think. I'm not really sure how that system works again. But I was getting ready for a camping trip, a school camping trip. And I was in the living room of my grandmother's house. And in this living room, we have a huge picture window that takes up one whole half of the room is all windows with blinds. And uh, it was already at night. It was probably eight o'clock at night. It was already dark outside. And I had the TV on in front of me. And I was, I had all of my camping gear laid out in front of me and I was kind of taking inventory making sure I had everything I needed and I can't really say what made me look out the window but something got my attention and I turned my head and looked out the window and I saw these green lights it was uh it was kind of like a ring of about six or seven green lights that were kind of in a rotating pattern around like it was like you could see the lights kind of moving side to side in a circle and when I first saw it like you don't you don't think anything when you see something like that you don't react to it as if you're oh I'm seeing a spaceship no it just Oh, what are those, you know, those lights on the window? Like you don't even, when you see something that strange, you don't even automatically assume you're seeing something. You think, oh, there's some trick of the lights going on here. And so the first thing I thought was, oh, there's something reflecting off the TV, reflecting onto the window I'm seeing. And I actually remember what was on TV. I think it was the David Letterman show was on the TV. And so I, my first instinct was like, oh, this looks weird. I need to like figure out what this is. So I jumped up and I started moving in front of the window, moving my arms around and shifting around to try to figure out how that light was reflecting onto the window. And As I started moving around and shifting around and I could see the reflection of the TV in the window and this, this ring of green lights was not part of that. And as I started moving around and trying to like kind of shift my perspective around, I, I realized that what I was seeing was outside the window. It wasn't, it wasn't a reflection. I was seeing something outside. And so then I got a little freaked out because I, I felt like I was act, I saw like I was seeing something. There was something out there. So I glue my face to the window and I get a good look at this thing. And it wasn't a hundred percent dark outside. I could see a little bit. It was kind of that in between twilight and pitch blackness outside. And so there was these this thing that had these green lights moving around it in a circular pattern and I could see the uh, kind of a shape that was behind these lights it was I mean the the best way I can describe it is think of a flying saucer just the the most stereotypical uh, idea you have in your head of that and it it was thicker in the middle like if you hold your your hand out in front of your face and measure out like two inches with your fingers. That was about how wide it looked uh, from my perspective. And then it kind of tapered off to the ends with these green lights spinning around it. And it was kind of tilted at a 45 degree angle. And it was just slowly like drifting towards the ground, like just slowly falling towards the ground. And once everything hit me, once everything kind of like sunk in and I started realizing what I was seeing, I never, 
I wouldn't call it simple fear. It was like, it was like, it felt like my mind was breaking. Like just my mind was snapping as I, as I watched this thing because this, this, this flood of feelings came in. Cause I was like, damn, I'm, I'm seeing something here. Like I already knew what UFOs were. So I was like, I'm seeing like some kind of craft that's outside my house. And I couldn't really tell distance too well because of how dark it was. And I wasn't really sure of like what the scale was of how big this thing was. But judging by the landscape, because there's a, there's a field out front of my house. And then there's a highway that goes perpendicular in front of my house. And that highway is about a, like one mile away from my house. And so judging by the way the horizon kind of like tapers off farther than that, I was judging that this thing had to have been, if not in front of the field of my house, it had to have been at least on the other side of the highway. So it was not far away at all. And it was drifting towards the ground. So I'm thinking, is this thing going to land in front of my house? And then so instantly... My mind just blew up and I I freaked out for a good five seconds because I thought, I'm watching a spaceship, UFO, whatever you want to call it, landing in front of my house. Like, nightmare level of, like, freaking out. And so this thing's slowly drifting down, but then as it got to, just as it was going to start like getting close to touching the ground, like when it got to like, say, uh, treetop level, in in literally like a split second, less than a second, it went from being pointed down 45 degrees, it switched uh, orientation to 45 degrees up in the air, and shot off into the sky so quick that the lights that were around it kind of left a trail in my vision because it was so fast. It moved so quickly in this, this totally odd, you know, flash change in direction and shot off into the sky. And it took me like a second or two to like for it to settle in what I saw and I ran upstairs in my house and I started blabbering and yelling to my my parents about how, well, my, my grandparents, since that's, that's who I was staying with at the time. I started blabbering on like a madman, trying to like spit out the story right away. And like I was, I was completely hysterical because uh, right from when I was young, I had always been afraid of aliens, honestly. Because um, I, 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 I'm, I still think to this day that I had been abducted a few times. I don't know how many times, but I knew I had been visited by aliens in the night. I'm just going to say that. You know, I'm just going to throw that out there. Because like I said, the show is about me venting too. It's not just about me trying to put on a cool persona or I want to like sound cool on my own radio show. No, I want to like say the things that I, that are hard for me to tell people. So I, right from when I was very young, I always knew I was getting, I was in contact in some form with some kind of otherworldly being. So this, this thing would freak me out because I felt like I was getting like such a, like in your face kind of vision of what was going on. So I'm all hysterical, raving like a madman, talking to my my grandparents, and <laughs> they they just brushed it off. They're oh, you, like, yeah, yeah, you saw what? Oh, okay, all right. Like they didn't say nothing because what could they say? If I was them in their situation, I wouldn't have believed me. Really, I mean. A, uh, like, how old was I then? Uh, if a, you know, 
a 13, 14 year old kid comes running up to you yelling about seeing a UFO, how, you know, how seriously are you going to take that? But that experience, which was one of tons of UFO sightings I've had, but was the most uh, unexplainable one, I guess, is the the, the word to use. Uh, coupled with a lot of experiences I had when I was young and as I got older, where I really felt like I was getting visited by aliens. And one experience <laughs> that happened when I was a little older, in my early 20s, where I literally came face to face with an alien you know like a lot of people will try to say like that they know categories of like oh there's the greys and there's the uh andromedians or you know and there's the 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 tall nordic whites and there's the, you know like they you've heard people on the internet that have they they claim that they know all of these uh, subcategories of the reptilians and the draconians and the the ones from Zeta Reticuli and they know all these little like races of aliens I have no clue I have no idea I don't know I don't know I don't know whether there's these different groups but I did come into face to face contact with one type of alien once and it was probably one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever had. And my point is, is that this whole alien phenomena and this UFO phenomena is, it affects people. I mean, it's just not that for me. That's not the only thing that made me weird and made me paranoid and, you know, uh, led me to ranting about this stuff on the internet on my own show. But my point is that these experiences are important. They affect people. They affect people's perception and how they relate to the world. And if you're not, if you don't believe in any of this, like if you're if it's the year 2015 and you're completely denying the reality of UFOs or that humans are in contact with some uh, non-human entities, whatever they may be, things from underground or things from other planets or the moon or whatever you want to think, if you're denying this stuff completely, well, I mean... I don't know how many of you are out there that are still denying all of this stuff, but just have some sympathy for the people who take this stuff seriously because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people that have had these experiences and it's serious. It's scary. It it changes the way you you think about things. And if you if you forget about these experiences, if you uh, suppress a lot of these encounters and sightings, yeah, you can go on with your normal life and you can kind of keep buying into the the popular narrative of what our life as humans is supposed to be on this planet. You can go about a normal life. You can believe what you watch on the news and you can uh, believe in the normal normal vision of what life on planet earth is supposed to be like but that's all I'll say is have some compassion for the people who take this stuff seriously because it's it's heavy it changes things it's hard to forget about. And for people like me, I still deal with this issue on a regular basis. Like someone might say like, 
Oh, oh, so what are you? You're so afraid of UFOs and aliens and you're so concerned about it that it's affecting your life and you you can't like let it go and you can't just go about your business? No, I can't because this is big. This is a big, quite possibly the biggest topic of human life is this idea that we we have interactions with something, some kind of group, some kind of other group of living beings that's, by all accounts, light years ahead of us. That's so far above our level of technology, our level of mental and spiritual advancement, that the way a chimpanzee or a primate living in the jungle would react to seeing us, there's something that humans have been interacting with for a long time that might be that high of a jump from us to them. And if that's not important, if that doesn't matter, then I don't know what does. So... This topic isn't done. I still have a lot of other things that I'd want to get into, but hey, this is just the first episode. I just kind of wanted to give everyone a taste of what this show is going to be about. Is I I, uh, I don't mean to have sounded so crazy and intense for the first show. You know, maybe we'll have other shows that are more a little more lighthearted, but I just kind of wanted to start off with some things that I really want to get off my chest. So um, I hope you come back. I hope you come back to listen to another show. Like I said, uh, we'll be dealing with totally different topics each time. You know, we'll, we'll ramble here and there on different things. I might have a co-host here and there or different guests. You know, we're going to have a lot of different stuff going on. So... Uh, I think I'm going to wrap it up there. We're at an hour and a half. And uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Sky King Radio. And uh, once again, I'll plug all the different places that you can find us. I urge you to go to anonymoustruthers.com. If you go there, you'll be able to like find a thread about Sky King Radio. You'll be able to listen there to Biased Propaganda Radio, which is an internet radio station that you'll eventually be able to hear our episodes on. And I'm going to post links there on uh, Anonymous Truthers. You'll be able to find the links that I talk about. And as I said, uh, main places to like find information on the show will be our Facebook page, which will be under... Sky King Radio. I don't think I don't think there's any other radio shows by the name of Sky King. I think we I think we cornered the market on our name, luckily. So I don't think you'll find too many other radio shows with the same name, so it should be easy to figure out who we are. And like I said, if you want to get in touch with the show, you can Get in touch with us through anonymoustruthers.com, that forum. You can send us messages on our Twitter page. You can follow us at Twitter, uh, Sky King Radio, at uh, twitter.com. Uh, let's see here. A, yeah, we're on Twitter. We're just at uh, at sign Sky King Radio. You know, pretty simple. Uh, YouTube, we have a YouTube page, channel, that Sky King Radio, same thing. It's all pretty simple. So yeah, find us. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, we're. I'm still working on the infrastructure of the show. Like, you know, eventually we'll have... Uh, our own website, you know, I'll work on things. So look for us. And uh, 
Hopefully the show will keep growing. We'll keep getting more episodes down the pipe. And uh, remember, this is a completely independent radio show. We're on one person. I, I'm i not a rich person at all. I'm actually a pretty uh, poor right now. So I put like what little resources I can gather into producing this show. So I hope it's going well. I hope the sound levels and things are good. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. If any of you are listening to this end of the show, thank you. Thank you so, so, so much for your support. Thank you for, you know, encouraging me. I'd like to give some shout outs to uh, some different people on uh, the Anonymous Truthers Forum. I'd like to give a shout out to um, Vicodin Rat. Thank you so much for, you know, supporting me, for encouraging me. I'd like to thank uh, Bug Out Girl on that forum. You know, thank you for being great and and setting all of this, uh, this forum up and uh, making it uh, a great place to go for people who are interested in these kind of things. Thank you to Liberty on the same forum who uh, has been setting up his own little internet radio station and I hope we can work out some things for uh, getting this show out and some more content to people and uh, yeah thanks thanks a lot everyone this was uh, this was a lot of fun I hope I hope I work on things and um you know maybe I was a little bit nervous you know I gotta work on my voice and such but uh, thanks for listening and uh See you on the other side. See you later.